Thank you very much for having me. This is, this is honestly the most delicious slideshow I've ever given. <laughs> so I'm super happy to be here. Very honored um, that you would have me. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about our organization, but so just I will say a word in case you're not familiar with us. Um, we are ORS, which is the uh, watershed organization for the Sudbury, Assabet, and Concord Rivers. We used to be OR, the organization for the Assabet River, which was formed 33 or so years ago um, because the Assabet was so incredibly polluted. And you, if you don't remember those days, it's sort of hard to believe how bad it was, but it was, it was known as the cesspool of Massachusetts, to give you an idea. Um, you really you had to get the Clorox out every time you went paddling and clean off your boat. So we've, we've worked hard on that, and um, we've met with a lot of success. And so uh, we, in 2011, we added the Sudbury and, and Concord Rivers to our mission. So now we do the whole watershed, which basically goes, we have a map over there, but it, the Assabet and the Sudbury both start in Westboro, and they flow north, and Assabet goes through Stowe, and then they meet in Concord, and then they become the Concord River, which flows north under Old North Bridge um, to Lowell, where it joins the Merrimack River coming from New Hampshire and flows out to the ocean at Newburyport. So that's our beautiful river system that we're part of. One of the things we're working on is to try to enable the fish to come from the ocean the way they used to, the river herring to come up the Merrimack and then up the Concord. They currently get blocked in Bill Ricca, but we would like them to get past that dam and then come all the way up here. So we are part of a much bigger system. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today, and feel free to interrupt me, and I, <clears throat> I will keep this to, um, to a bit less than half an hour, but I'd love to have you know, time for discussion questions, um, because this is really about you in the end. It's your river. and. Um, we really encourage everybody to see how they can be stewards of this, this really valuable resource. So next slide. Thanks to Bill for faithfully advancing the slides. So why did we do a river report card? So we saw that um, other rivers have used it quite effectively to communicate uh, to the public. So here we are in 1996. Earlier this year, EPA gave the Charles River a barely passing grade of D for water quality indicating although the river is improving, much work remains to be done. So, next slide. By 2017, news release, Charles River water quality improvements earn an A- minus for the second time in the past five years. People can kind of get that. Hey, it's improving. And then they might start being more interested in it next. And so, but then, well, things don't always go forward. Um, it dropped from an A minus to, the, to a B. Why? So now that's a great thing to start discussing. And you get, you get good news coverage. It communicates clearly to people. Next slide. And so then, uh, here's another one. This is the Mystic River. Mystic River was horribly polluted as well. Um, made it A minus. And then, what I liked about what they did was that like, A minus, hey, that's great, but look at that's the main stem of the Mystic River, but what's happening in Belmont and Cambridge? You know, what's happening over here in Chelsea? So that starts to, if you break it down a little bit, you know, you get away from averaging everything, where everything sort of looks basically okay, but if you start to break it out, you can see, oh, that's where the problems are. Next. So we decided to look into this. Now those former ones, uh, were done by the EPA and they were looking at just one thing, which was bacteria. Human bacteria, what's in the river, it's dangerous stuff, you don't want to swim in it. We weren't actually monitoring for bacteria, so that was problem A. Uh, but we also looked around and there was this really interesting system being used by um, the Center for Environmental Science at the University of Maryland. They'd been looking at river systems and issuing report cards. And they had been working with really big river systems like the Orinoco and the um, Mississippi. Next. Um, so, we, so, so we figure we're iconic too. We're just a lot smaller. And uh, they were interested in working with us. So next slide. We got a grant 
And um, we started to work with them. And this beautiful thing about their system is it has a methodology. And so we could really work through it. They'd done it with a lot of other communities um, on, on grand scale. Next. So um, what is a river report card? So the idea is that um, you can look at not just one indicator like bacteria, but you figure out what is it that people care about, about their rivers. So you can look at cultural things, you can look at economic things, as well as just the, the water quality data. This on the right is the Chesapeake Bay, incidentally. Um, you're using defensible scientific data. You can synthesize a lot of information into something that's readily understandable. And the main thing for us was this is stakeholder driven, which means there's a lot of wild cards, um, but it means also that the people who are involved really get invested and it's their common vision. It's not meant to be my vision for this river. It should be everybody's vision. Next. So, uh, and the other thing about it is that you can take a lot of information that's very detailed that maybe scientists will be interested in and you can take it all the way up to all these different audiences till you finally get to the policymakers who, as we have widely heard, only like to read one page. So you can turn it into one page. And speaking of which, uh, maybe this is technically more than one page, but you know, we've been able to produce something like this, which is pretty under, you know, easy to use. Okay. Um, so, sorry, Bill, it's like 700 slides. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 okay, sit real close. <laughs> um, so the, the different steps are, so first you want to figure out what's the big picture, what, are, what do we care about, and what are the threats to those things. And um, is this on okay? Yeah, all right. Um, and then the next thing is what do we measure? So okay, we have to measure these things. How do we pick what to measure? What are the indicators of health? And then what is healthy? Like thinking of your, th you know, your temperature. What is, you know, 102 uh, temperature is not healthy. And then how do you add that up? How do you create a grade out of that? All right, so keep going. There's a whole, you can just, yep, more, 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 more. Keep going, keep going. We've done all those, now we're at the last bit. So here we are. Um, this is the starting, I'm gonna tell you about the process, which some of you may not be interested in, but it's kinda, it kinda helps you understand like how do we come up with that like one letter grade. So next slide. Um, what is the big picture? So what were the values and threats we brought together? We tried to get a very diverse group of people from the whole watershed. Next. And um, the first thing we did was just say, just give us one word that describes each river. What is it to you? So we have some really great ones here like water. Um, <laughs> that was really creative. But then we've got you know, lake and marsh, pastoral, paddling, um, duckweed. Um, home, cleaner. So next, we put these into something, I don't know if you've seen a Wordle, but it's a little appy thing. And it takes, it, it create, puts the words in number, the size reflects how many times that word was used. So you can see the acibet, what most people thought about was wild, canoeing, scenic. Next slide, for comparison, oh and I think snapping had, was connected with turtles, it's just not snapping alone isn't a thing. Um, Sudbury River, water and floodplain, Fairhaven Bay. And then the next one, the Concord River, bam, you know. This is what people think of when they think of the Concord River. All right, so next we, um, we went through that step. Next, we started to look at breaking it down. So what are the different values to us? What do we, why do we care about this river? So here we have history, beauty, well, people put it down and then we'd start to think of categories. Habitat, wildlife, health, recreation, climate, literature, history. Literature, you know, I mean, this is a really interesting thing about our rivers that especially the Concord River was the home to some real literary giants who influenced environmental consciousness uh, for the rest of our, you know, up to today. And um, that's one of the values that the rivers were designated as wild and scenic. That many years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, some pretty interesting things about our rivers that others don't have. So, next. Then we tried to bring those, okay, so let's, you know, put those together. Um, uh, so, the main values of our rivers water quality and quantity, 
ecology, like habitat, wildlife, public health and safety, cultural scenic, recreation and economy. And I just put this little umbrella here for climate vulnerability and resilience because we know we're in a climate crisis and the climate crisis is going to affect a lot of those things. So everything, you know, everything is affected by climate, just about, and um, we don't want to forget that as we move forward. So next slide, please. So then we looked at, well, what are the threats? So we all had maps, broke down into groups, and you could see people, there's a lot of detailed knowledge in that room of people saying, oh, I know about this kind of thing, that kind of thing going on in the section of river that I'm familiar with. So then the next one, uh, this is just, to, these are some of the stakeholders. So like this guy runs the wastewater treatment plant in Bill Ricca. She works for the state. She's a conservation agent for Acton. Um, you know, uh, we had really, varied group of people. And we did games and stuff, and which, uh, which was really fun. I mean, I think people started to work together very nicely. Next slide. And um, so, okay, uh, let's see, yeah, next one. So then we had to figure out what to, to measure. For that, we got a slightly different group of stakeholders. These are all folks who work with data. They're from the USGS, the US Ge Geological Survey. Um, uh, MAPC, the planning people, people who know about GIS, all of that, because what we wanted to figure out is not just like, well, it would be great to measure this. We need to know, can you measure it? Has anybody been collecting data on that? Do they do it frequently enough that we could update a report card? So these folks were able to give us information on that. Next. Um, and so with them, we worked, talked around, well, so what, what are the indicators that we should use? So if you're talking about water quality, it might be nutrients, contaminants, dissolved oxygen. But looking at, say, contaminants, we have some pretty big issues around here around, say, PFAS or um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, very serious problems in our rivers, but they're really hard to measure. So maybe we can't include them in this report card. Doesn't mean they're not important, but maybe we just can't measure them yet. Okay, next. So then we did a first cut on, okay, if our, if our, so our goal is fishable and swimmable for our rivers. We know that much. <laughs> then these are the values. So recreation, what are the things we should measure for recreation? This is what we came up with, free from excessive biomass, like plants growing in the water, <coughs> bacteria, public access, passability, like around dams and trees, flow, edibility of fish, and then we started moving them around to like get them into good categories. I think actually the fish ended up back in, it's crossed out there, but it ended up back in recreation. Okay, next. And then we did a test run, like how is this gonna work really? And um, so we had our six values that we decided on. And then we, in the process, we realized that like we needed to break the river down and into some sections somehow. We are only dealing with the main stem of the river because Dealing with the tributaries is too much at this point, so it's complicated enough. Um, so we decided to do upper and lower for each river. So the upper acibet has a grade, the lower acibet has a grade each way. Because, and look at Concord, like lower Concord River is really different from the upper Concord River. And we needed to break that out. To average those two just wouldn't make any sense. Next. So we took a deep breath, put out a newsletter, and then next. We worked at ORS to, tr to pull all this together. Okay, so next. Um, how does it going to add up? Next. And so, you know, we had to decide on how we were going to do the grading. Um, we decided on a 100-point scale. Next. Uh, and then we had a third workshop, and this one was to get feedback on the, all that work that we had done. Like, does this make sense? Did we do it right? Should we do it differently? Next slide. And so our trustee stakeholder group, um, pretty much the same people who were at the last ones. Um, next. And uh, as a result of that, we canceled out economy because we had no data. We didn't know, the, the, boat, <laughs> the boathouse wasn't gonna give us their tax returns. The, um, 
the, the national parks, you couldn't attribute all of their visitors to coming to see the river. Uh, so we really, that needs more work. And we hope to eventually be able to get some idea of how does having a river, a clean river in the community affect the economy. And public health was important and we moved some of those into other categories. Next. <coughs> so we also wanted to just hear a little bit more about in a, in a qualitative way, how people, what people think about these rivers. So we asked people for a full sentence or two, um, not just a single word. So I'll just read to you. So example for scenic. The scenery of rivers provides joy and serenity in our hectic lives. This is available to everyone for free and should be available to future generations. It changes constantly, especially with the seasons, from subtle to dramatic, always something new to inspire us. And I think that, you know, that's pulling together several people's comments and, and I think that starts to get it like why we care, right? Okay. Oh, and the recreation is, is how people connect to the river and it's important for public well-being and local economies. These rivers should be a destination for hiking, biking, boating, fishing, swimming, and bird watching, and accessible to everyone. And that last B piece, accessible to everyone, is a real challenge, right? Okay, next. So, okay, let's keep going. Here we are, gory details, next. So just to say that if you actually really want to understand the details of how we calculate any of this, we have a methods report and it's on the website. This is the website of the report card and um, you can download it and read it. So um, I'm going to whip through this, but if you want to know more, you can look at that. Um, yes, next. Okay, here you go. Go Bill. Yes, lots of spreadsheets. Next. And then we use those spreadsheets to start to calculate the, the grades for the different um, sections and different values. Okay, so that's what we came up with. Next, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so our staff scientist was really good at statistics um, and we had various people reviewing the, um, what we came up with and we did run into some thorny issues in terms of, for example, just rounding. If you round down versus up, you get different grades, as you might recall from when you were a student or a teacher. Um, so we had to make some judgments about, you know, statistics are fine, but there's all these value judgments embedded in them. And we wanted to be really clear about how we made those judgments. Um, and you'll see a few statistical things pop up in here. Um, the good news is I think we've done the basic work, so updating it, we won't have to go back into re-examining all the statistics behind it, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty data heavy that way. Next. So let's look at each one by, I'll just take a slice of the pie and look at it. So water quality, <clears throat> we looked at dissolved oxygen, temperature, <clears throat> we had pH, but we realized pH isn't going to change, just thank goodness we've solved the acid rain thing. So let's put in floating biomass instead, because we really care about that. Phosphorus, nitrates, suspended solids. Those are all things we've already been monitoring for over 20 years. We have all that data. We're good. Okay, next. Um, and then this is how we actually did it. A, a click again. So we would take, say, this is the dissolved oxygen level. We have a rating curve. And then click again. And you will see that that gets us to a score of 40. Okay. And um, again, again, again. We did all those. This is just water quality. This is the most data heavy one. Next. And um, that was that. <clears throat> so next one, please. Next slice of the pie. <clears throat> Stream flow. Also a bit of data in here, but this is a tricky one. So what do we care about and how do you measure it? So we decided we weren't going to think about flooding the very high flows too much because those don't affect water quality as much. We're going to mainly focus on low <coughs> stream flow, so summer droughts. Um, but we still wanted to see, like, is it a natural stream flow? Like, is this, <clears throat> is this impaired in some way? So we actually compared it with a um, unal relatively unaltered stream in Massachusetts, which is something we didn't have to do it ourselves. The Nature Conservancy had done it already. 
um, which is the Squanicook, one watershed over, um, and we compared how the flows in our rivers, how they compare with, with those ones. Next. Um, so, yeah, that one we just talked about. Uh, and then there's all, in groundwater, there's only one monitoring well in the whole watershed, and it's in Acton. <clears throat> so that's a little suboptimal, but at least it's accurate um, and hopefully reflects, because groundwater doesn't change very fast, um, it reflects the trends for the whole watershed. Next. So, oh, let's see what the next slice is. Habitat. So we looked at aquatic connectivity and habitat connectivity. So habitat is like if you have just separate little pieces of land and they're not connected at all, the animals can't move between them, they can't migrate, it's really not as good habitat. Aquatic, pretty much the same idea. They, fish and other aquatic life need to be able to move to escape droughts, to find food, to find breeding grounds, very important. Um, ecological integrity, again, we took this from another source. Um, and impervious cover is so important that we broke that out and, and rated it separately. Okay, next slide. Habitat, I'm not going to go into this. 40 indicators. We just took it as it is. We worked with our local land trust to figure that one out. Okay, next. Percent impervious, very important. We know it affects water quality in a big way. It affects... So impervious... Sorry, yes, please interrupt me for crazy terms I use. Impervious cover is pavement hard surfaces, roofs, driveways, roads, parking lots, anything that water can't soak through. And unfortunately what we've done is turned, you know, forests and fields into a lot of pavement. And so it's very clear correlation. There have been several studies done in Massachusetts on this that shows that water quality and fish life is actually directly correlated with the percent of impervious cover. And it doesn't take a lot to, to um, really degrade aquatic habitat. And the good thing is that there's, um, there's a lot of data on this. So we can get, you know, every few years they're updating the analysis of the state. So we can actually keep track of that. This gets back to like why we do green infrastructure and rain gardens and um, really key work happening now to reduce the impact of stormwater. Next. So coming up we have scenery. So this was fun. We didn't know how to do this at all. But luckily, the National Park Service has been working on this for a while. So next slide. We, did a, um, we followed their methodology, which they'd never used on a river before. So everyone was learning. Next. Um, we got trained. We did lots of field work, did lots of thinking. We analyzed a whole series of sites according to their methodology. We had a lot of discussions about, like, why do they? This doesn't make sense. Um, but we, we were pretty satisfied with it, with it in the end. Next slide. So here was what we found. Some examples, the upper Assabet. This was a site, we didn't go, we didn't, we didn't do it from the river, which would have been ideal, but would have taken an awful lot of time. We did it from a spot where a lot of people would see the river. So a, a commonly used place. Um, so here we have the Hudson Library. <clears throat> did not fare very well, it got a C. Um, and a low overall score. It has various problems. This is a hardware store. This is their storage area with lots of equipment. There's phone lines and stuff going across there. It's, you know, the rail, it's just not, it's, it could be improved. If we get to Ice House Landing in Maynard, <clears throat> in this section of the river, better grade, high importance, um, pretty natural, some interesting variability. There's the dam. Um, next. Then this was the, where Nash Neshoba Brook enters the Assabet River, also the lower Assabet. This is where we had real problems with this methodology. It's got a C plus because, well, it doesn't have a lot of different textures or lines or shapes or visual interest. It's just pretty, you know? So we would have, <clears throat> if we'd had our druthers, we would have had, this would have been higher, but we followed the methodology. So anyway, yeah, pretty. And here, um, Lower Sudbury, Sherman's Bridge, a uh, very high, really beautiful spot. Next. And, um, oh, try, oh, that's funny. That's my own slide problem. Anyway, um, Fairhaven Bay, very pretty. But, ah, one huge white house there. 
It was just driving everybody crazy. Like, couldn't they have painted it green? You know, like one person like made this scene kind of, it really degraded the score. It would have been A otherwise. Anyway, okay, next. So that could be improved, right? Um, and of course, North Bridge, A plus, very high. No surprise there. Bartlett's Landing in Bill Ricca, a lovely put-in to go paddling. Again, very pretty, not very exciting, but um, I forget why it got a high, but anyway, it was a nice spot. Next. And then we get into a different kind of landscape. Luckily, we weren't scoring them against each other. They had different criteria for urban versus suburban versus rural. So Bill Ricca, North Bill Ricca, you've got the dam, you've got a bridge. It's actually a very busy scene without the dam. That would be really pretty with just the rocks and the riffles. So anyway, that one, that one got a C plus. Lowell, <clears throat> very historic. Um, it didn't score badly because it's urban. It scored badly because it's actually in pretty crummy shape, quite a bit of it, um, not taken care of. It could actually be improved and, and, and improve its score quite readily with a bit of, of tender, loving they, care. Do they need the dam for water control? Or? They don't need the dam. No, um, it used to be very useful for the mills. There's two mill, old mill buildings there, but nobody uses it anymore. It is, this is the dam that blocks the migration of the fish. Um, and the, the, the state is not thrilled with the condition of the dam. Um, and uh, we are all not thrilled with the fact that it is really blocking the fish. And so there have been studies, and it's, it's conceivable that it will come out. Um, Thoreau, who worked a lot on this stand, he was actually a commissioner there at one point, said, I, I bet that in 200 years people are still going to be arguing over this dam. <laughs> He's right. What about the upstream water level of the dam left? Right, so that's one of the main concerns is the, uptake, the intake for the Bill Ricca water supply is upstream of the dam. The first study done for this a couple years ago showed that actually there's another natural dam above this that it would protect the water level for the intake. Um, so, uh, but that's, that is the next study, that ha a detailed study has to be done on that, because obviously you're not going to take it down if it's going to threaten the town of Billerica's water supply. They're the only town that actually drinks directly from our rivers. Okay, so that was scenery. And lastly, what do we have? Recreation, passability, if you've ever been in a boat, you know that you might come up to a dam, you might come up to a bunch of trees blocking the river. We couldn't actually deal with the trees thing because it changes so constantly. That's another project we have going on, we're starting up now. Um, and then we also looked at putting in, is how easy, how many put-ins are there. Um, fish edibility is very important, not just for people who fish for recreation, but there are a lot of people um, people of lower income who actually want to eat the fish in this river and are, are not able to. Um, and then bacteria for swimmability, we are collecting the data now. Okay, so, uh, so you have the card. All of this is on this really cool website. You can just go there and you can click on Streamflow and you'll see these colors change. You can click, even get down in, into the detail. You can click on nitrates, and you'll see these colors change. So that is, a, it's a, and then we'll get more into the website. But there, all this is there, and you can really have a great time playing with it if you're that kind of person. Um, next. So what's the story? Um, we launched it in June. We got some great press coverage. Next picture slide. Um, and uh, so, for example, this was in the, the Lowell Sun. We sent them the information about the Lower Concord, got a C plus. That was pretty newsworthy to them. Next. Oh, yeah, and we made beer coasters because we think they look like coasters. They're officially called wagon wheels, but you know, we, we like beer. So, um, so this is what we came up with. And what's interesting, next slide, is this best sec, whoop. Yeah, you did. Back up. They're up. There. Oh, it doesn't want to back up? That's okay. I can tell them. All right, there you go. Um, this middle section is what's designated as wild and scenic. It also happens to be the part that's in the best condition. Um, next slide. Oh, yeah. Yep, there we go. 
So what I want to do is, I don't think that clock moves. No. <laughs> I've been using that to time my talk. <laughs> it's like, wow, I still got so much time. OK. Um, so I'm going to just run through the results for those different sections, but focus on the lower acibit, which is where we are. Um, but I'm kind of kind of go through it pretty fast. But so um, next slide. Um, so one thing about these grades is that most of the data is from 27, 2018. Um, there was no drought in 2018. Rivers were looking pretty good, actually. Now, when we do this in two years, because we plan to do it every two years, we may see some of these things change if we have a drought, OK? So it can be quite sensitive to some annual things. And we're hoping that it's also sensitive to longer term things like climate change and land use change. Um, so in the upper acibet, um, there's a big influence from the wastewater still. That's why the acibet was a cesspool in Massachusetts. Um, and they are really doing a good job of removing phosphorus, but they are not removing nitrates. And that's clearly showing up here. And we still have a problem with floating biomass, which is all of the aquatic weeds um, that we see in the acibet. Um, recreation, there's a lot of put-ins. But there's a shortage of trails along the river. Uh, and so one can improve a C plus. Yes, next. Yeah. How are they controlled? Yes, so the wastewater treatment plants, um, there's uh, six of them in this river system, but a lot of them are just upstream of you here. So Westboro is the biggest. It, it services Westboro, Shrewsbury, a um, bit of Hopkinton. There's Marlboro, which also handles Northboro. There's Maynard. There's Hudson. There's Concord. There's Bill Ricca. There's Wayland. In Maynard, we get reports on Right, so pretty much, and that's really actually been the focus of the work of, of ORS. We have pushed very, very hard for phosphorus removal. So when they, re, when they um, upgraded their treatment plants, because they were over 20 years old, back in 2004, we pushed for very, very stringent phosphorus limits. We actually appealed the permits, and the result was that these plants went in with very advanced technology for phosphorus removal. Um, and uh, so that is really why we're not seeing the rivers, if you might remember, that they used to be just bright green all summer. Mm -hmm. That was from duckweed, and that was really as a result of the phosphorus. That's not happening anymore, but there's still a lot of historic phosphorus that has accumulated behind the dams, so that's why we still have a problem. The nitrates, they don't actually remove um, because phosphorus is the controlling nutrient. But the nitrates is a, are a problem once you get out to Newburyport. Um, and so we don't, A, we don't think we should be polluting the, the, the estuary, and B, if we control the phosphorus well enough, the nitrates are going to be what's going to cause the plant growth. So we're, it's, we're starting to see an increase in nitrates, so that's why we flagged that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so that's the upper acibit. Um, the issues are wastewater, the dams and impoundments. Wherever you have a dam, you're creating a <coughs> pond, essentially, and you get different kind of fish community, pond fish, essentially. You get the biomass problems. And then <clears throat> we're starting to see it across the state. You've seen it in the news, probably cyanobacteria, which is really a nasty stuff that, that grows in our water mm -hmm. bodies when it gets warm and stagnant with a lot of nutrients, those three things. And with climate change, we can expect <clears throat> that all to be happening more. And of course, we have the water chestnut. Next. <clears throat> oh, water chestnut. Yeah, so that's Crow Island, um, one of our <laughs> great volunteer pullers. Uh, next slide. We do a lot of that all summer. Um, so what can be done? Um, Clean and recharge stormwater. As I mentioned, there are new stringent uh, rules from the, under the Clean Water Act, the state and all our communities must comply with. We were also involved in that, another <laughs> uh, lawsuit, um, which 
force the state, the, um, the, the, the EPA to actually put those in place. Um, and uh, so that means your own highway departments and planning and conservation need to be very firm about making sure that stormwater that runs off the roads is collected, cleaned, recharged, because that's the major source of pollution now in our rivers. Um, cold water streams, those little tributaries that feed the river are, um, are key to maintaining the health of the river and they in themselves are very, very valuable. Um, they have uh, eat wild brook trout, they have all kinds of other habitat and wildlife that are, we would like to protect. Um, conserving water during droughts, a lot of you probably have your own wells uh, or if you have town water, we have not, the state has not been good at actually conserving the water when we have an emergency situation. And the thing is, is that for a lot of communities, there is no alternative. If they're near the MWRA, they can maybe connect, like Framingham does, or Ashland had to in an emergency. But a lot of our communities don't. And we have very small, shallow aquifers that we depend on entirely. So we need to really pay attention to that. And the last thing I want to point out there um, is that the fish contamination by mercury is statewide. Does anybody know why there would be statewide fish contamination mercury? Acid rain. Well, that's basically you, yes, except that it's not the acid rain, but it's still the rain, or it's the air, so that when coal contains a lot of mercury. So if you have coal-fired power plants in the Midwest, that the emissions from those plants float over us. Now, part of the problem used to be sulfuric acid, and that was the acid rain. They put scrubbers in, they're no longer emitting that. They're controlling the sulfur, but they're not controlling the mercury. And so our state gets a constant rain of mercury from those power plants. And why I say, like, what we can do about that is there, were, there was a rule going into effect that those power plants had to remove the mercury. And the current administration just removed that rule. And so we were all very involved in at least commenting on that idea. Um, but, you know, how things go these days. We did not uh, seem to have affected it. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't all continue to advocate for removing mercury um, emissions in, in the country because it affects us here. Next. Um, and this is the lower acibet, uh, which is where you are right now. Um, the acibet always flows because of that wastewater, continual wastewater coming from upstream. That's why we care about how clean it is, because it's our water. Um, the acibet can be 95% wastewater in a dry summer. So thank goodness they clean it up well but it's still full of all kinds of things that they can't get out, like pharmaceuticals. Um, we have, so next slide. We have a good number of put-ins here. So you can see the lower acid is in pretty good shape. It's a B, good passability, because um, you can get around those dams, lots of put-ins, nice level of trails. Um, uh, the flow is pretty good. These problems aren't quite as bad as in the upper acid. Same fish problem. Um, and, uh, yeah, we don't have so many cultural sites, but it's pretty beautiful. All right. So the way we looked at trails was we measured trails within 200 feet of the river. We just drew a band along each side of the river. We figured like, well, you don't want trails on 100% of the river. That'd be a bit too much. And you'd like to have some places that are undisturbed. So we said, okay, 25% would be about optimal. Um, and it's also achievable. And look at that, lower acid at 22%. So where we are, so that's us, um, we're, we've got a pretty good score here. Upper acid only had um, 7%, so that's why they are in the D zone there. Um, in fact, it's the, upper, the, I mean, the, up, the lower acid is, is the best in the whole watershed. And it's a lot of effort by communities, land trusts, all those folks out there building trails and maintaining trails. Thank you. It means that, all, it means that people can get to the river without having to be in a boat, for one thing, right? Okay, next slide. Um, 
Hmm, next slide. Here we go. The, another one was passability. Uh, the whole ACIBET did pretty well on that score. That would be a B. Um, and we looked at, um, so here, for example, um, the number of river miles, nine and a half, with only two dams. So that shows one reason why it's, it's got a pretty good passability. Um, other places are much worse. Upper Sudbury is only is 12 miles with eight dams. So they got a pretty low score. But the lower Sudbury did really well, um, 22 miles with only two dams. All right, next. Where does, where does the upper and lower meet? Yeah, so um, the break here, it's just, uh, it's just after the Hudson, just after you enter, so between Gleasondale and the Hudson line is where the division between the upper and lower Sudbury is, ah, uh, Acibet is. Was that your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we did that based on um, sub-watershed delineations done by the US Geological Survey. So we figured that was the scale that worked best for um, this exercise. Fish edibility, I've already talked about this. Um, but so the statewide for the upper acibet, lower acibet gets a C because Basically, no children under 12 and no women who could be reproducing should eat any fish at all. We figure that's not very good. That gets a C. Um, uh, the Sudbury River here has an F. The reason is there's an um, additional source of mercury, which is this um, Nyanza Superfund site in Ashland, um, which is actually here. But we had to, of course, do the whole section. So but it's actually about starts about here. Um, and uh, absolutely no one should eat any fish ever from the Sudbury River below that super fun site. Um, it gets diluted a bit by the time you get to the Concord. Um, and so a few more people can eat the fish. Don't eat the largemouth bass. So um, now this is something that, again, that could improve if it has improved already because we've gotten rid of a lot of the incineration in Massachusetts, cleaned it up, and also dental mercury isn't being used anymore. So oh, there was a lot of mercury in our waste stream um, from dentists, and that has been eliminated. So you know there, there can be ways to improve on all these things. Next. And uh, last, almost. So the actions here. Oh, I already did that. So we're good. Yes. Next. Oh, there's a wild eastern brook trout. They're so beautiful. As good as any tropical fish. Next, and that's a little cold water stream. So I'll just whip through the others so you see what they are. Upper Sudbury, we didn't have as much data for the Upper Sudbury. We have to fill that in. Um, next, Lower Sudbury. We've got the data, but there's some issues um, about the habitat. Um, it's the Sudbury is very altered and weird stream flow because of all the dams and the water supply systems for the city on it, um, and the fish problem, but it's very beautiful. Next, Upper Concord, um, see some, definitely some improvements. It's got twice the flow of the other two rivers, uh, and so it's, um, and it's quite well protected. It doesn't have as many trails, but it's also got a lot of wetlands along the river, so it's a little hard to put a trail through it. Um, next. And the lower Concord, you can see the influence of that. It's really an urban watershed there. Um, you've got, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of city. And so the habitat's not doing very well. The river's pretty good but, and well connected, but the, the land isn't and got a lot of impervious cover. Um, and as a result of that, in part, is the stream flow alteration and not a lot of access points or trails. The good thing here is that the um, Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust is working a lot on trails, and I expect that grade to improve in the next couple years significantly, so that will be good. Next. So um, that's the website. Next. And um, when you go on it, you can even get down to the level of the data, so that's, I have to actually add the units of measure there, but um, you can get for each data point actually what the data are. If you want to, house nitrates. Next, um, we have issues that we talk about: climate, 
uh, invasive aquatic plants, various other issues that, we, that aren't really good for grading at this point, but we thought they were important to raise. Next. <clears throat> what you can do, which is, of course, very important, um, a lot of our work is done by just regular folks who go out there at, uh, early in the morning and collect data on water quality. We have some other citizen science projects coming up that we want to do for, um, on both invasive plants and river passage in terms of trees that are blocking the way. Next. And that's it. Thank you. Um, so we wanted to thank our, the people who funded this. Who are, if any of you have one of these license plates, you helped fund this research. Um, this, the Environmental Trust uh, gets money from the, sale, the additional sale on uh, cost of those license plates, and it funds some of the best environmental research in the state, um, uh, I say humbly. And um, it's really important. So if you get a chance to get a new license plate, get one of those. Um, and the Sudbury Foundation. We had some great partners. Next slide. Um, and just to show the breadth of the stakeholders who were involved in this process, all types. Won't dwell on it. Next slide. And so the real question ends up being, you know, how do we raise these grades? Um, and when people ask me, how is the Acibet doing? Or how are these rivers doing? First I say, well, there really, there's some great improvements. There are some things that are problematic that we're having trouble measuring and controlling, like pharmaceuticals. And then there's the, that umbrella thing, like what is climate change going to do to these rivers? And we know some of the things that it's going to make worse. It's going to make flow worse. It's going to make the river hotter. That's going to make it worse habitat. It's going to make invasive plants worse. So how can we slow that process down or not let that process happen and still actually make improvements, given that the environment is going to be changing. And I think there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that individuals can do. There's, there's a lot that ORS can do. Um, and so that's what I want to leave you with. And thank you very much for, your, for listening.